Stand for 911, where's your emergency? Oh, this is Sandy, 241 Rock, Rock Crimson Road. What's Send the problem? The police. Send the police. What's hey. the problem there? The, the, the chip killed my, my friend. He's killing my friend. Who's killing your friend? Chip, my chimpanzee. Oh, your chimpanzee is killing your friend. Yes. She, he ripped her apart. Hurry up. With a gun. Is the monkey still by your friend, or can you get close to your friend? He's eating her. He's eating her. Please. God, no, please. Okay, I need you to calm down for me. I know it's hard, okay? I know it's hard. But they're going as fast as they can your way, okay? Oh, my God. Please. Please. Dogs, cats, and birds are often kept as pets because of the unconditional love and companionship they provide. These pets commonly become beloved family members, but occasionally certain people seek out other, more exotic animals, attempting to tame and domesticate them as pets too. But how domesticated can these wild exotic animals be? Few owners would ever consider that their beloved pets could be harboring a dark, savage side capable of inflicting horrific damage on people and property alike. But for some exotic pet owners, when they find out the harsh truth, it's already far too late. What is up, Iwu crew? The shocking story we have for you today is wild, gruesome, and incredibly tragic. It's a warning to anyone who dreams of keeping an exotic animal for a pet. In 1995, Sandy and Jerry Harold sought out a chimpanzee breeder from Festus, Missouri, who ran a sanctuary. Though they themselves didn't operate a sanctuary, they wanted to buy a baby chimp to keep as a pet at their home in Stamford, Connecticut. The breeder, Connie Casey, bred a male chimp named Coco, who had been taken from jungles somewhere in the broad region of equatorial Africa in the 1970s, before being bought by Casey for $12,000, and a female chimp named Susie, who had retired after being on display in a zoo. On October 21st, Casey called Sandy and told her, your baby has arrived, it's a boy, and to Sandy, the little chimp really would become like a baby to her. Sandy quickly set off to meet the baby chimp she had excitedly been waiting for. But in order to take the baby from Susie, Casey had to tranquilize the mother chimpanzee. The baby chimp was named Travis, after the country music singer Travis Tritt, who was a favorite of Sandy's. As a newborn, Travis was said to be covered in black hair everywhere but his pink face. Sandy had cried while meeting the baby chimp for the first time when his tiny hands and feet grasped her own hands as she held him. Without hesitation, Sandy paid $50,000 in cash to Casey and soon took the three-day-old tiny chimp on a flight and then home with her. Much like a human baby, Sandy cared for Travis by feeding him his formula through a bottle, burping him, and even putting him down for naps in a crib. All the while, she and Jerry played with Travis and started to teach him to respond in English. They taught him to brush his teeth, much like a human, and even purchased an entire wardrobe for him, which they would dress him in every morning. He often wore baseball shirts and sometimes a baseball cap. As he quickly grew, he started to move around more, no longer satisfied with dragging himself around on the floor. The Herald's house was large, but not equipped to satisfy a growing chimpanzee. They soon had to adapt their house to fit his needs. Much of their house became spaces designed just for Travis. Not only did they cage in a large room just for him, much like a bedroom, which was attached to an outdoor enclosure for him to access and outfitted with tires and ropes. But they also gave him a few other rooms all to himself that he would be able to move about whenever he was alone. The couple had to put a lock on their bedroom door, but when they were home, Travis had run of the entire house. Eventually though, Travis was sleeping in the Herald's room and though they had given him his own mattress, he often ended up sleeping in bed with the both of them. 
Travis would even reportedly join both Sandy and Jerry in the bathtub. Sandy would later remark, until you've eaten with a chimp and bathed with a chimp, you don't know a chimp. Travis ate all of his meals at the table with the Heralds. And as he grew older, he even began drinking wine with dinner from a wine glass. The Heralds' entire lives became consumed with Travis, and they even began bringing him to their work with them. The Heralds owned a towing company, and there was a large room above their tow shop. They soon filled the room with tire swings, ropes, and trampolines for him to play with as they worked. Sandy had a daughter named Sue, who had a young son, Tyler. As he grew up, Tyler would often play with Travis, much like a human childhood friend. Even though they were actually similar in age, Travis matured quicker than Tyler, and gentle Travis would often care for the young boy. He was known to hold him in his lap and give him kisses. The Heralds really did seem to regard Travis like a human child, taking him to the beach with them, teaching him to ride a bike, and even how to control a ride-on lawnmower. He would water the house plants, feed the family horses, get himself a drink from the fridge and pour himself a glass, and even join them at restaurants. The Heralds appeared to believe that they had socialized and domesticated Travis, and that because they treated him like a human being, he almost was one. They didn't see him as a pet, but as part of their family. Sandy, in particular, viewed Travis as her son. Travis soon became a local celebrity in Stamford. The police were known to take pictures with him and strangers would approach the Heralds to have pictures taken, sometimes even getting Travis to hold their children and pose. The Heralds eventually used him to advertise their business because he was so well known in Stamford. Sadly, Sue, Sandy's daughter, passed away in a motor vehicle accident, which sent the grieving mother into spiraling depression. The tragedy also resulted in her considering Travis to be her only remaining child. Travis took on the role of Sandy's child easily, and he accompanied the couple even more frequently. But though he often behaved as though he was human, the Heralds would soon learn they couldn't always control him. During a drive through downtown Stamford in October 2003, the Heralds stopped at a red light and for some reason, someone threw an empty plastic bottle into the half-opened window where Travis sat. Travis's reaction was to grunt, unbuckle his seatbelt, open the car door and knuckle walk across the road. While out on the street, Travis reportedly lunged at someone walking by before he began climbing over cars and swinging around the street. The entire time, he was smiling and hooting as the Heralds attempted to get him back in the car. Nothing they did could get him to calm down and leave, not even their usual bribery of cookies and ice cream. After some time, a dozen police officers were called to help wrangle the loose chimpanzee, but he saw the officers as part of the game and started chasing them. For two hours, Travis evaded capture by local police. He would enter the Herald's vehicle and then swiftly open the doors and jump out before they could lock him in. Finally, after tiring of his game, Travis climbed into the vehicle and buckled his seatbelt to leave. The Heralds reportedly kept Travis contained in his room the next day because he had been grounded for his actions. Even though police all agreed he was being playful, it was also clear that the Heralds didn't have complete control over Travis, and that even the police had been unsuccessful in capturing him when he was loose. The incident received a lot of attention, and because of it, the State Department of Environmental Protection became aware of Travis. They determined that the Heralds were violating a statute which required them to have a permit in order to keep an exotic primate of Travis's size and weight. Despite this, they chose not to take Travis from them, mostly because of his status as a local celebrity and partially because they didn't want to appear cold-hearted and harsh. They also claimed that they didn't believe Travis was a threat to public safety. It is important to note that most of the Stamford police officers knew Travis quite well, 
and almost all of them had posed with him for a photo at some point, which may have influenced their opinions on the incident. However, an animal control officer named Lynn Della Bianca was very concerned. Officer Della Bianca came to speak with Sandy about keeping Travis and told her that adult male chimpanzees were as strong as five grown men and known to be unpredictably violent. Della Bianca also told her that because Travis was now an adult at this point, he had reached his sexual maturity and in the wild, chimps would be engaging in some sort of sexual activity daily, sometimes even up to 50 times a day. Travis would have those same urges, but could become violent because of them. Even though Sandy listened to Della Bianca's warning, she quickly dismissed the concerns as she had never seen Travis display any kind of behavior close to violent. Still, Officer Della Bianca cautioned that Travis would live until he was 30 or 40, and she couldn't predict his behavior for his lifetime. Della Bianca later revealed that Sandy had expressed to her that she knew she wouldn't be able to keep Travis forever, and that one day, he would have to go to a sanctuary as he would become harder to control when he got older. But Sandy had withheld the entire truth from Officer Della Bianca. Two years prior, in 2001, she had been told by Travis's breeder, Connie Casey, that Travis's parents, Susie and Coco, along with another chimp, had escaped from their cages. On the loose, they had allegedly aggressively approached 17-year-old Jason Coates's vehicle. Coates claimed that he and his friends were trapped inside as the chimps bared their teeth and rocked the vehicle. Coates eventually broke free and ran into his house to get a shotgun. By this time, Casey had arrived and tranquilized Susie, but she was still conscious. Though Casey had begged Coates not to use the weapon, he was reportedly afraid of the chimp and believed she would attack. He shot her three times. Susie died two hours after the incident. After the fact, other witnesses came forward and said that the chimps were being playful and friendly, and Coates served a month in jail for property damage and animal abuse. But he still maintains that the chimps had posed a threat to him. What's more, there was an alleged incident in 1996 with Travis, where he had actually shown that he could be aggressive. Leslie Mostel Paul had seen Travis while he was in the Herald's vehicle and asked Sandy if she could approach him to say hello. Sandy had said it was fine, but when Paul tried to shake Travis's hand, he grabbed her hand and bit her. The bite was deep enough that it drew blood. Paul later described that she felt like Sandy was more aggravated than upset about the incident, as if she was annoyed it had happened. Paul said that she had to get a rabies shot just in case because Sandy took so long to prove that Travis had gotten his shots. Paul was so upset by the incident that she reported it to the police, but she was disappointed when the matter was never looked into. Later, the police would claim that they never received Paul's report. In hindsight, these glimpses of aggressive behavior were hints to the horror that would occur in the future. Regardless of if the Heralds believed that Travis was a threat or not, they still no longer took him out in public, as it was clear they wouldn't be able to capture him if he didn't want to be contained. Reportedly, the mayor at the time warned that if he got loose again, he could be shot. Trapped at home and no longer allowed to accompany the Heralds to work or on outings, Travis began to sulk and mope about being cooped up in the house. Around this same time, Jerry became incredibly ill with stomach cancer, and Sandy was spending all of her time with him in the hospital. Jerry began to worry that if he passed away, Travis would be too much for Sandy to take care of on her own. He even suggested that she take him to a sanctuary. When Jerry died on April 12, 2004, Sandy felt incredibly alone. And despite Jerry's worries, she chose to keep Travis with her. Travis also appeared to mourn in his own way, taking the pictures of Jerry off the wall and kissing them before holding them to his chest. He even started to take care of Sandy, 
filing her nails and brushing her hair when she sat crying. A year after Jerry passed, Sandy debated sending Travis to a sanctuary, even writing a letter to the owner, but she soon changed her mind and never sent it. Part of this decision was because Sandy and her friend, Charla Nash, a single mother, had reunited after Jerry passed. Sandy allowed Charla and her young daughter to live in a loft that she owned and even offered her a job bookkeeping for the towing business. Their friendship seemed to save Sandy from the depths of her despair, and Charla often spent time helping Sandy take care of her house as well as Travis. Charla had experience with Travis, as she had visited quite frequently when he was younger, and he often climbed up her legs and shoulders and played with her blonde hair. Now that she was back involved in his life, Charla soon started making jokes that she was Travis's aunt, as she often took care of him. For four years, Travis never left the Herald property, and in that time, the chimp had transformed. He was 14 years old, and due to Sandy's inability to care for him as well as she once had, he had gained enormous amounts of weight, coming in at around 240 pounds as a result of eating only junk food, such as ice cream, popsicles, and fish and chips. He spent his time watching one of the three TVs all day or playing with his own pet cat named Misty. Though Sandy appeared to be recovering from the devastating loss of Jerry, Travis's agitation grew over the years, and he was often irritable. It seemed that being cut off from the rest of the world and limited to only the house, in addition to the pain of Jerry's sudden death, caused Travis to lose some of the sweet nature he was known for. He was particularly surly on February 16, 2009 just as Sandy was about to head out of the house to meet a friend. Sandy tried to calm him by getting him to color or draw, watch TV or eat, but nothing seemed to distract him from his agitation. She worried about him enough to put a Xanax pill into Travis's tea in the hopes that he would settle down. It didn't appear to be working, as Travis took her car keys and went out to the yard where Sandy failed to coax him back into the house. He clearly wanted to go for a car ride, which he was no longer allowed to do and was pacing across the yard. Panicked, Sandy called Charla. Later, there would be a disagreement about whether or not Sandy asked Charla to come and help her or if Charla had volunteered to come over herself. Either way, Charla arrived at Sandy's house around 3.40 p.m. and found Travis out in the yard. At first, Charla held up an Elmo doll she had brought to distract Travis. She held the doll over her face, but he reacted in a way she hadn't expected at all. Upon seeing her, Travis charged across the yard, about 35 feet away, running on his knuckles in a rage before rearing up onto his two back legs right in front of her. Stunned, Sandy had shouted at him that it was Charla and for him to stop but Travis didn't listen. Instead, he shoved Charla against her vehicle where she then dropped to the ground. Seeing his sudden attack, Sandy screamed for him to stop, but when he didn't, she grabbed a snow shovel and hit him over the head. Despite Travis screaming as well, he didn't stop his attack on Charla who was defenseless against the enormous animal. Sandy ran back to the house and grabbed a butcher's knife to defend her friend. She stabbed Travis three times, but he didn't even slow down. Allegedly, Travis paused only once to stand up and face Sandy where she stood petrified. He made eye contact with her before turning away and continuing his assault on Charla. Not knowing what else to do and fearing he would attack her as well, Sandy ran to her car where it was parked nearby, knife still in hand, and locked herself inside. She made a frantic call to 911. Sandy sobbed while screaming for the police to arrive. She asked for the police to bring a gun to stop her chimpanzee from killing her friend. The chimp killed my, my friend! What's the problem with your friend? Oh, 
Please. What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. There's a police officer with a gun. With a gun. They gotta have their guns out. They, they gotta have their guns out. Listen to me. Oh my God. And quote, he ripped her apart. Hurry up, hurry up, please. The dispatcher had reportedly believed the call was a hoax, as they never expected to hear reports of a chimpanzee attack. He's killing my friend! Who's killing your friend? Can't my chimpanzee! Oh, your chimpanzee Wait. is killing your friend! Yes. He, he ripped her apart! Hurry up! With a gun. Hurry up, please! He ripped her face off! He ripped her. She's dead. Why why are you saying that she's dead? She's dead, he ripped her apart. He ripped what apart? Her face? My, everything. Is the monkey still by your friend or can you get close to your friend? He's eating her. He's eating her. Please. God, no, please. Okay, I need you to calm down for me. I know it's hard, okay? I know it's hard. But they're going as fast as they can your way, okay? Oh my God, please. It wasn't until Sandy screamed, he's eating her, that they took the call seriously. When the police finally arrived, they found Charla lying on the ground mostly naked from Travis ripping at her clothing. She appeared to be dead. Travis was angrily roaming the yard, but rapidly approached the police vehicle. He yanked at one of the police doors, but found it was locked, and then swung around to the other side. Here, he easily knocked off one of the side view mirrors before he yanked on the other door. This one was unlocked, and it opened. The officer on that side was Frank Chiafari. He described that Travis was in a frenzy and that he recognized the chimp from his visits to the police station to take photos with the officers. Officer Chiafari was startled by Travis's blood-stained face and he pulled out his gun. Officer Chiafari described the incident saying, he gave me a split second to react. He shows his teeth, a snarl, and I see blood. I see his fangs. I just start to shoot. Travis was shot four times, and at first, he didn't react. Then he shrieked, defecated, and ran away. A group of officers set after Travis, but he managed to sneak back into the house during the chaos and went into his room. It was there that he collapsed from all his wounds and died. The police couldn't have prepared themselves for the carnage that they discovered at the scene. Shockingly, Charla was still alive, and she moved trying to get the officer's attention. The vicious attack resulted in the loss of her nose, both of her eyes, her lips, and scalp. Most of the bones of her face were broken, and she had lost one of her hands and most of the other. The injuries were horrific and extensive, and she wasn't expected to make it. But Charla was swiftly sent to Cleveland Clinic in critical condition, and there she underwent seven hours of life-saving surgeries. She managed to hang on, and despite all odds, she survived. Though doctors were able to reattach her jaw, the chimp had given her an infection which caused Charla to become permanently blind. The story shocked the entire world. Immediately, Sandy became the target of reporters horrified by the shocking case. They attempted to lure her out of her house for an interview, but Sandy refused to speak to anyone for weeks after the incident. She was often demonized in the eyes of the press and seen to be at fault for Travis's attack. The media even went so far as to make unseemly accusations against her relationship with Travis. There were also claims that Travis had appeared on Mari Povich's show and in a TV show with Sheryl Crow and Michael Moore. Later, Sandy would mourn the way she was portrayed in the media, as though she had cared more about Travis than Charla. Sandy defended herself, saying that she stabbed her own son trying to save Charla. She also later described that it felt as though she had stabbed herself. It had upset her so much. Sandy even elaborated that she believed that the moment when Travis turned to face her after she had stabbed him, he was asking her, quote, Mom, what did you do? 
Sandy was further horrified when she went to the crematorium to deliver Travis's favorite tie-dyed t-shirt and found out that the chimp she thought of as her own child had been decapitated in order to have a rabies test conducted. The test result revealed that he didn't have rabies, which would have explained his violent attack. There were other explanations later offered for the savage attack. Though Sandy may have viewed and treated Travis like a human son, he was a wild animal, no matter what she believed. Without knowing it, the strangely close relationship Sandy and Jerry had with Travis may have played a role in causing his attack. In the wild, chimps are very territorial and often get into violent altercations when they feel their space or mate is being threatened. When Charla arrived at the house, she had a new haircut and was driving a different vehicle, one that Travis wasn't familiar with. As Travis was so bonded with Sandy, he likely thought Charla was a threat when he didn't recognize her. Others believe that the chimp had spent 14 years of his life repressing his true nature because he lived like a human being for so long. They think that the attack was inevitable, as it was only a matter of time before the chimp would act like the animal he really was. As well, there is some debate on whether or not the Xanax Sandy gave to Travis may have made him more inclined to attack as the medication wasn't prescribed to him. In humans, Xanax can cause hallucinations, aggression, and even mania, though it is an anti-anxiety medication. It very well could have been Sandy's attempt to calm Travis that sent him spiraling into a rage. Sandy later denied ever having given Travis Xanax, but the examination of Travis's body had shown evidence of the drug. Officer Chiafari later reflected that despite Travis's devastating attack, he views the chimp as a victim as well as Charla. He should have been in the jungle where he's supposed to be, not in a house drinking wine and taking Xanax. Reportedly, Sandy slept with an urn every single night that contained the ashes of Travis's body. When Sandy passed away in 2010 at the age of 72 from an aortic aneurysm, she was buried with the urn in her hands. Since she passed away 15 months after the attack, some have said that after the loss of her daughter, husband, and the chimp she treated like a son, and the maiming of her close friend, she had died from a broken heart. Charla's family sued Sandy only a month after the attack. They asked for $50 million. They eventually settled on $4 million and Charla herself then attempted to sue the state of Connecticut for $150 million as she claimed they knew Travis was dangerous from previous incidents, but she lost the case. Many of the surgeons who worked to save Charla, as well as the police who responded to the horrifying incident, received therapy in order to cope with what they had witnessed and the harrowing memories. Yet, it was Charla who showed incredible resiliency. She later remarked in an interview, I just want to get on with my life and get better. On Charla's 56th birthday, only nine months after she had been attacked, she officially revealed her new face to the world while on the Oprah Winfrey show. Charla also explained to Oprah that she couldn't remember much of the scarring incident and that she didn't want to. The show shocked viewers as Charla appeared on camera after receiving a graft from her leg to create a nose. Though she survived numerous injuries, there was little that surgeons could do cosmetically as some areas of her face would never look the way they did before. For two years, Charla underwent numerous surgeries. Though all helped to salvage her body after the savage attack, she was also the recipient of innovative transplants. Charla underwent the very first double hand and face transplant in the US. Though all transplants were initially successful, Charla developed pneumonia as she was healing. Her body rejected both of the hand transplants and doctors were forced to remove them because of infection which caused poor circulation in the limbs. 
But even after receiving the revolutionary face transplant, which her body seemed to be responding well to, Charla still suffered other setbacks in her road to recovery. As can occur with many transplants, her body began to slightly reject the tissue of the transplant. She had actually taken part in a military-funded study trying to determine whether or not recipients of transplants can be weaned off of anti-rejection drugs, which come with other serious side effects. Often seeking to aid others, Charla chose to participate in order to help military service members who become injured enough to need transplants. Even though she risked her own body rejecting the tissue, Charla reportedly didn't regret helping in the study and believes the research will help others. Once she was back on the anti-rejection medication, her transplant was successfully accepted. She now has a nose, lips, and jaw again, and her face has utterly transformed. I just feel like it's my face. It's just not working real good, Charla shared. Today, Charla survives with the help of an aide who comes to her home most days of the week. Her life has been radically altered as she is blind and has lost the use of both of her hands. Yet, all Charla wants is her independence back. And now, after adjustment, some days she can even function alone. She appears to just want to move forward from what happened to her. Her friends and family describe Charla as always having been a survivor, and it was her fighter spirit that has allowed her to thrive even after so much trauma. She once said in an interview, I know I always had an attitude to whatever came my way. You know, I'd overcome it. I wouldn't let it hold me back. The tragic story of Travis and Charla is not an isolated incident as there have been numerous other instances of exotic animals kept as pets who either escape, show their wild nature, or even attack their owners. Even when these animals appear domesticated, they are often unpredictable. If there is anything to take away from the tragedy of this tale, it is this. Exotic pets aren't safe to be kept in the home and should be left in the wild, no matter how much they are loved.